Hi, welcome to Embedded Programming. Now, in this video, we're going to be looking at pulse width modulation, and we're going to be doing it with the Formatic protocol, which we've installed on an Arduino board and our ESP8266 board so far, and of course, using the GoBat client library for Formatic. This is going to be sort of like a little mini series, um, episode four. So it's, there's part one, two, and three. Um, there's so much material when I started putting this together that I had to break it up in several parts. So enough dilly dallying, let me just get to it. And you're gonna see how much material is just in this first part. The second and third part, I'll try to keep them even smaller, but we have to get going. We have to start somewhere. So a lot of grunts to cover first. Okay, so our objectives. What are we gonna be looking to accomplish at the end of this video? So we're gonna learn what pulse width modulation is. Not width, but width, like the width of something, okay? And you will see where this width come in, right? Like, you know, height and width, or width and height, however you wanna say it, but that's the width that we're talking about, right? We're gonna look at implementing pulse width modulation. So even if you don't know what pulse modulation is, and the illustration don't help, I think when you see the code and we go through the examples, we should be able to even get a handle on it. And then we'll look at using GoBot's pulse width modulation support and see why that is a little bit better. Um, not only is it easier to use, but also you're gonna see it though, it's a little bit more performant in my opinion. I'll try to explain that. What are we gonna use pulse width modulation for? In this part one, uh, we're gonna use it to control the brightness of an LED. Oh, that doesn't seem to make sense right now because you don't know what it is. But pulse width modulation comes in very handy, especially when you want to control the brightness of something like an LED, but also really cool when you want to control the speed of a motor. Don't worry about it so much. We're going to see that in like part three when we start looking at controlling a motor. But for now, just know that pulse width modulation comes in very handy, and we're going to start by controlling brightness of an LED. We're going to do this by looking at how to use pulse width modulation on ESP8266. And of course, we're going to take the same Go code, modify it a little bit, and run it on our Arduino board. And that is, of course, for people who do not have an ESP8266. And also to demonstrate what I've said about the GoBot library and all um, GoBot package and for matter is this nice capability you have of moving your code very easily and making it very portable. And the other thing we'll do is look at identifying which pins on your board if your board have built-in pulse width modulation, how you can identify which pin has pulse, pulse width modulation support and why that might be a good thing to have built-in pulse width modulation support. Before we get into what pulse width modulation is, let's sort of talk about a few key concepts that I'd like you to sort of remember or take away. Now, I'll cover the concepts and then I'll sort of illustrate it and hopefully by at least showing you two times Maybe um, if you're new to this sort of material, hopefully you remember it or it will sink in. So there's the idea of voltage and your voltage always toggle between on or off. Usually that's going to be zero to five volts, but it may also be 3.3 um, volts, like in the case of the ESP8266, which generally runs on like 3.3 volts. Either way, it's going to toggle between the lowest voltage and the highest voltage of your digital circuitry. I want you to keep that in mind. No, there's no in between. It's either it's on or it's off. Key concept is the voltage always toggle between these two extremes when it comes to pulse width modulation. Another thing is voltage is either on or off at the start of each pulse or cycle. Now, there is the pulse in pulse width modulation, but we also I'm gonna use the word cycle sometime when I talk about pulse. But every time you start a cycle, you're gonna have a pulse. And at that time, the voltage is either on or off. If it's on, then it's going to be on for some duration of that cycle. If it's off, well, then it's going to remain off. You don't turn it on later on in that cycle. Again, this is going to make sense when I show you some illustration, but I want to talk to you about it before. So keep in mind that voltage always toggle between on on and off. And at the beginning of a cycle, it either on or it's off. That's it. All right. Do the cycle. That's the percentage of time per cycle that the voltage is on. I just said that at the beginning of a cycle, you have the option of the voltage being on or off. But if it's on, then it's on for a percentage of time for that cycle. 
Now, percentage of the time for that cycle could be 0% all the way to 100% of the time of the cycle, which means for whatever how long that cycle is, then the voltage is either come off. If it's off at the beginning, it still remains off. If it's on, then it may come off at some point before the cycle ends, or it might come off at the end of the cycle. Then there are X cycles or pulses per second. Now, people who uh, mess with frequency and stuff will go, hey, are you talking about cycles per second? That's frequency. Yes, that's, that's frequency. So there's some frequency associated with pulse with modulation. And for us, that's going to, when we come to controlling LEDs and motors, about a thousand hertz. But we'll get to see that and play with that later on. But for now, um, just these things are what I sort of want you to have in mind. Don't worry, stop and memorize it. If you just sort of have an idea, um, then let's move on. So let's imagine that time goes from left to right here in my illustration. What I might want to do then is put voltage on the vertical axis and label the bottom of that as zero volts. And then my maximum in this case is five volts. Now again, remember you can have like 3.3 volts. If you're controlling a motor and the motor um, takes 12 volts or 24 volts, then you're going to be pulsing that motor with zero to 24 volts. Okay. Um, you're going to go through a relay, of course. Remember I said that all these, these cycles that happen. So if you can imagine as time goes on, so my first pulse is at time one, my second pulse is at time two, my third pulse is at time three and so on. So these are the times that I send pulses and notice that they're evenly spaced. I am not allowed to vary the time between pulses. So people who know about, you know, um, sinusoid and stuff would say, oh, this is just your period. We can take away some of this noise by removing those numbers and removing the time because we can imagine it now, right? I'm trying to reduce the noise on these charts. So let's remove that. What I said before was at the beginning of a cycle, the voltage is either on or off. So in this case, let's imagine that at the beginning of the cycle one, if you remember that was my first cycle, the voltage was off, which means it was zero, right? And at the beginning of the second cycle, the voltage was also zero and the third cycle was zero and so on, right? So over the, 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 the set of cycles or over all of these um, periods, the voltage was zero. So the end result, if I keep this, or at least for these four cycles, I send zero voltage and therefore deliver zero current to whatever device I'm controlling. So, you know, I kept that thing off over these four cycles. In this case, when you do this, we say that oh, your duty cycle was zero, zero percent duty cycle. Why? Because you remember, we said that oh, the duty cycle is the percentage of time that the voltage was on in each cycle. So the voltage was on zero percent of the time doing any one of these cycles. Let's look at another example. So I'm starting again and I'm looking at my first pulse. And let's say my first pulse, my voltage is at max, right? It's on. So over that entire cycle, it's on. And over all the other cycles, my voltage is on. Now, what I want to show here, or I want you to take away is that the beginning of each cycle, my voltage was on, right? To the max, the beginning of each cycle. So for 100% of that cycle, the voltage was on. And similarly for 100% of this cycle, it was on and on. And so we can say and because it was 100% on for all the other ones, we can say our duty cycle was 100%, which means this is no different than if we turn something on and forgot about it. Because at each pulse, each time we, we begin a cycle, we had the voltage on. Let's look at a slightly different example. What if I were to turn on my voltage at the beginning of the cycle, but only keep it on for half the cycle? And I do this at every pulse. Remember, every pulse, I can either turn on the voltage or turn it off. So the beginning of every pulse, I turn it on. But because I'm turning it off midway or halfway through that cycle, what I end up with is a 50% duty cycle. And so this is the same as if I had sent half as much current to that device. I had it turned on only half the time, essentially. And if I do this fast enough, the end result is, is that if I'm controlling a LED, it would look half as dim or be lit half as bright as the full brightness. And if it's a motor that I'm controlling, guess what? It will run at half the speed. Even though at each time I powered it at the full voltage, but because I did it so quickly and only for half the time, it's as if I only send half the current. 
And so this is more efficient for DC motor, for example. Here's a chart that I got from Wikipedia and I augmented a little bit with my green lines, but here's some example of, you can have any duty cycle, you know, from zero to a hundred percent duty cycle. Now I said that a key concept here is that we have multiple cycles, right? Or multiple pulses, the pulses occur at the beginning of each cycles. And you have about a thousand cycles per second. So this is happening really, really, really fast. And we'll get to play with all of that. Let's take a look at which pin on our ESP8266, for example, that we'll be using. So I did a Google search and found an image of what looks pretty closely to the board that I have. Um, so if we look along this edge of the board and we can see there's a D0 and that data zero is tied to GPIO or general purpose IO pin 16. And um, it color coded to set out it's a general purpose pin. It can be for the user, I guess. That's what I mean. And it's also used for waking up the board, I guess. These pin can have multiple functions. And the little wave like marks here, this tell you how this pin also supports pulse width modulations. The fact that we've seen this on this pin tells us that how this chip can be programmed to perform that, those pulses that we saw, the pulse width modulation on these pins. So we have one pulse width modulation pin here and three more. So this board supports four pulse width modulation pins. The advantage of that is that we don't have to code it in code. We don't have to say up, down, up, down, on, off, on, off, which is what we're going to do but it's just good to know that the board also has it built in. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so let's start with data zero. So we're going to look at how to control this pin. So the question then is how should we control this pin? Should we use pin zero in our code or D zero, or should we be using some other number like pin 16 or something? So let's switch now to our editor and start writing some code. Okay, so here I am in my Visual Studio Code editor and in my directory for embedded programming. We are in four, so we're doing pulse width modulation. And like I said, we're gonna do this in a few parts. Now I have some circuit designs and there I have images of those circuits in the circuits directory. And I also have the fits in um, project file. So if you don't know what Fritzen is, um, definitely check it out. I cover it in a much earlier video, but it's this free open source schematic editor. And that's the project file for the designs that I have. Don't worry, I'll show you that in a minute. I just want to tell you what's in that directory, but I'll show you in a minute. Now, in terms of the code, um, we're doing this in several parts. So we're going to, of course, start in part one. So here in my Visual Studio Code Editor, if I come down here and I go to part one, for example, we have a few exercises. We just looked at our ESP8266 board and we saw that we want to control pin zero. Now, I'm going to try and see if you can see this. So what I have is a 10 array LED um, here, but you could have individual LEDs. It doesn't really matter. This was just easier for me to use. And so this is pin D0 for me at the end. This D0 lines up or is in 16 here, just on this breadboard. And so I'll put this pin here into D0. It comes out, it goes into the anode of this LED to the edge, and then it goes through this resistor and then to ground. Usually you'd put the cathode of the resistor into ground directly and the resistor on the other side but if I try to use this over here on this board, you could see it all the pins wouldn't be able to fit in. So this was just an easier design. I mean, I could have used some wires and jump it over and all this other stuff, but it didn't seem to make any sense to me. So this was just easier. So wire up your board, whatever makes sense for you. And I'll show you a design just now that um, we're going to be moving on to next. But for now, um, let's try and see if I can get some light on this. Uh, hopefully you can see that. Okay. All right. So let's see if we can control that pin. And so let me power this up. So here's some code and 
Let's sort of zoom in and make it bigger. So we've seen this before. We have formatter, new TCP adapter. We create an adapter. Remember, adapter represents like a board. And we say, how are we going to connect to that board over the format using over using formatter protocol? And so we want to connect it over TCP IP. And so that's where this port number comes in. Now, we have a default port number. And this just allow me to run my application without thinking about what port is on. But if I want to connect to another board that's also um, using TCP IP, what I did was I used the flag library and call the parse function. And what it does is parse the OS arcs and remove anything that look like an argument and leave everything else. And if I check the length of that and it's equals to one, that means I have a value and I can use that value to as my port. So I basically override the default port. So that's all that is. So you're going to see this in all the examples. So I also print out which port I'm using. I call it port. So this is really the port <laughs> for TCIP, but I'm using port in the context here of a, for a adapter, then it's basically how do you connect to that, uh, that device. So once we have our board, we create a new adapter. Now we can create a driver or a device. And so we're using a new LED driver, and this is something that knows how to, over some pin, how to operate or use an LED. So there are different types of drivers, and we'll get to play with another one in the, this part. And so we get that from the GPIO package, right? Now, this, this is also a package that comes with GoBot. But these drivers allow us to abstract how to deal with an LED device, uh, regardless of which adapter we're using. So you can imagine that we can use a serial adapter or some other type of adapter connected to some other type of board and talking to the LED over that thing once we have the right pin, well, it shouldn't matter which board we're using. And so we pass our board to this um, function and it gives us a LED um, value. Now, which pin should we use? Now, we, when we looked at a board, we saw there was D0. Um, we can also call it zero. I guess, but we don't know. So let's try this and see. Now our work function was exactly what we've seen before. Every one second, we're going to do what? We'll call this function and the function will just toggle this LED. So here's an example. If we do LED zero dot, we can see all the methods that we can call. And there's a brightness, there's commands and stuff that we don't care about, halt, off, on. And so we can just call off and on or we can get back which pin we're actually tied to and maybe the name. We can call start and so on, but we don't need to take care of that because start is not going to be called for us when we register um, this device. But toggle is one of the nice ones that we can call instead of having to worry about on and off and how long we should stay on and anything like that. So that's the nice thing about this LED driver is that it gives us all the methods that make sense for an LED, like brightness and so on, on and off. And so we register or we create a new robot, we give it a name. We said, these are the boards we wanna use. These are our connections. And we only have one, and right now we only have one device. And then we say, this is our work function, which is after you've created a robot, you've connected to the board and started, and you've started out of these devices connected to those boards, well, then start the work function. And this is what we're gonna do. Toggle that LED. So hopefully this makes sense. The only thing in question is whether this is going to work when we use D0. Let's open up a terminal here. And so go run main. We'll just do it that way. And so we can see that's initializing. This is my robot. Uh, it's connected. It started the device. It's doing the work. And if we look, we don't see the LED look like it's blinking. And so let me turn off the light here so we can see. And that LED is not blinking. So which means that either our board connection is incorrect or our assumption of using D0 is wrong. And I'm going with the board is simple to connect. We just, if we can toggle that pin, it would simply turn on that LED. So I will just stop this and try something else. What is our other option? Our other option is to do just zero. So let's try that. And so if we run this and we look again, um, it's starting to work and nothing so far. So zero doesn't seem to be it. So what else could it be? So let's try one of the GPIO. So remember from our diagram that we looked at before, it says it's either D0, 
or is GPIO 16? So why don't we try pin 16 then? And so we try and rerun this and there we go and it look oh and it crashes and we get that you know index out of range so 16 doesn't seem to be it well if you figure out which pin you have to use on um, in gobot to use that pin please let me know so that does not work but i'll show you what works so let me turn this back on and i'll move it one over to what is d1 and before I go back to that, let me just show you, I went to Google and searched for this board that I showed you before. And we try, we try D0, we try zero, we try 16. 16 said was out of range. And now I moved it to D1 and I'm going to use five. Notice the same thing, GPIO 16, GPIO five. So I will use GPIO five instead. And I know this works. Now I'll tell you later on how I figure out what the pin mappings are and so on. But let's just run the code now so we move that to five i remember i just changed my circuit and move that pin over from d0 to d5 and so you can see pin five and as you can see it's blinking um that pin and let me turn off the light so you can actually see it so pin five is the thing that we need to use so that is going to tell us that from now on when we want to control a pin we have to use these numbers that come here, especially the GPIO. So if we want to control D2, we'll use four. If we want to control D3, we'll use zero. So when we were using D0, not D0, when we used zero as our second try, if we had something connected to D3, it would have worked, right? All right, so keep that in mind that these are the numbers that I'll be using. I just don't know how to get to this one because it's, it works for all these others. I've tested them. It just doesn't work for 16 because we have out of range. And I've looked at the Go code for GoBot and it contacts the board and try to get the capabilities of how many pins are available and stuff. So I'm not sure why that thinks that pin 16 is out of range. All right, like I said, this is gonna be a long video, so let's push on. So now we know how to have a pin working and blinking. That's good. And it's very straightforward code. So let's stop this. And let's move on to our second example. Now, by the way, when, if you look in the example, I tell you which um, circuit you should be using. And I said that oh, in this directory, we have the design. So ESP8222 LED, this is this guy. For D1, we have it connected to this LED. Um, D2, we have it connected to another LED going to the right of it. So that's the image. And of course, this is the Fritzen um, program. So if you have Fritzen install, there is the name. You can don't look for it, download it. There is the project. You can open it and get this exact same project. Now, if you do not have an ESP8266 and you're instead using an Arduino, then go to the Arduino LED PNG, this guy. And this is for five LEDs, but it doesn't really matter. If you don't have five LEDs, you only have one LED. Well, then this is the connection you use. Okay. And this is the circuit diagram. Everything else that we're doing, except for the port you're gonna be connecting over, you're going to, of course, change that, right? So you can see that oh, I, I said something like using this, this guy, right? And so if you are using um, a, a, an Arduino, remember that you can use GORT to scan serial, just change a code to, use the Arduino serial USB port. And of course, you're not gonna be creating a new TCP adapter. You're rather gonna be creating just a new adapter. We're gonna use Arduino much later, but just in case, um, just look back at that example how to connect to Arduino. But everything else in your code should work just fine, except of course, you have to change the port number. And for that, which port number should you use? Let's go back here. Let's go to our good friend Google. And if we search for, in my case, I have an Arduino Uno, you can see that oh, we're using the second pin, but we know that oh, this is not the number that you use. It's this number out here instead. So use two instead. So this happened to match up in Arduino, which is really nice. So if you use pin two in your Arduino code, you're actually gonna be controlling this pin. And so the reason I'm not using the transmit and receive pin because um, since it's over serial, that might also be tied to how you're gonna be uploading code to your board. So 
Um, and notice the little wavy thing, pulsic modulation, the little wave, those are supported on pin 3, 5, 6, 9, 10, 11. So the Arduino have quite a bit more pulsic modulation and it tells you that out here. Well, 6 instead of the 4 that we have on the much smaller um, ESP8266. All right, so let's get back to the code. I'm still sticking with the ESP8266 in my example for now, but I told you how to switch to Arduino if that's what you're using. And notice um, all I have to do here for this example is I've added a second LED and this is tied to pin four. And now I've added some, I've made sure that I've registered that device to be started but for my robot. So this is important, I added there as my second device. And what I have is a variable called period. Period is just how long I want a cycle to last, which is in this case, I want it to last one second. So 1000 millisecond is one second. That's how long my period is. Then I have a on duration, which is half of that. So if my period is one second, I want my LED to be on for half a second. So I just simply divide by two. And so I'm using time that, you know, millisecond here. So basically this value is a time duration. Now this fourth part is the same as we had before, just toggle the LED, except when we're toggling it every one second before, now I'm toggling it every half a second, which is why I have 500 milliseconds. Now what does this mean? Well before we would turn it on for one second and then we turn it off for one second. So our cycle or the period was actually two seconds. Now it's half that because if I'm toggling it every half a second, it means that it on for half a second, then off for another half a second, and then it repeats. So my cycle is just a second long, which is the exact same case here in the second function. Every second, call this function, and what do I do? So in this case, at the beginning of the pulse, I want it on, and because I'm gonna turn it on and go to sleep for a little bit, this is how long it's gonna be on for before I turn it off again. If I took out the sleep, essentially is I'll turn it on and then off immediately, and I don't know if the board is gonna register that or not, but certainly gonna be a little bit glitchy. So let's run the code and see. Now, oh, before I do that, I need to wire my board. So let me turn on the light. And I'll take another wire, I'll put it in this second LED. Now, what you should really do is disconnect power before you try. So I put it in the second pin here, D2, and I put it in my second LED. All right, so that's wired up. And now I'll power this back up and let's turn off the light. So we're gonna be able to see those LED blinking and maybe we shift this over a little bit because there's a little glare on the screen there. And so let's run our code. And there we go. Oh, we need to be in example two or exercise two. And so we do go run and we run it and we wait. And so we connect, we started a work function and we should see that our, our LEDs are blinking. Now the reason why they're blinking sort of um, different is because uh, we have two functions and when we say toggle, um, this guy might start off by turning it off. And of course in ours we started turning it on. So that's why they're sort of opposite. So what does this have to do really with pulsate modulation? We're actually doing pulsate modulation, but remember, it's how many pulses we can do per, or how many cycles we can do per second. Right now, we had one hertz. We only have one complete cycle of on and off per second because that's how often our function runs. So this is one hertz. Now, the nice thing is that because we have this as a variable, we can change this value at runtime, how often we leave this on, which is how long we sleep. So we can make this zero to say, don't sleep at all. Um, or we can, you know, make it, uh, the full period, which is to say, sleep the entire time. So let's see that. So if we go to example three, we haven't changed anything really other than now we said period is 1000. Here we had a duration where we were actually multiplying it by the time that millisecond, but now we just have the number. And so duration is still starting off at half that value. We haven't changed anything else except here we've done some modification. So basically if the duration is less than if essentially zero. If we don't need to turn on our pin, there's no point in us turn it on only to sleep zero time and then turn it back off. So in that case, we should simply just not turn it on. And what this does is if you take this code out, it still works. So for example, 
if you just take these two lines and move them up like this and then you take away this like that okay if you did that it still works as before but because our duration on duration is a variable which i'll show you how we're determining that just now when it's zero there's a little glitch where you see it comes on for a little bit and then we turn it off and i'll talk a little bit more about why we see this glitch so this makes it a little bit smoother and because i don't have enough time this video would be much longer than i already know it's going to be if i try to show you all those things so those are things you should play with and see for yourself so what are we doing so how do we get on duration well we have this read command what is read command there's this variable called percent which is an integer and we're going to loop forever and we're going to do is tell the user to enter a value between 0 and 100. This represents the percentage or do cycle, right? Remember, do cycle is the percentage of time that we turn on this, the pulse. So we're going to read that by doing a scan into this percent variable. So we have an integer that we have just read. Now, we tell the user 0 to 100, but maybe they enter another number. Now, we should probably make this unsigned int just to make sure that our... Uh, they don't enter anything negative, but that's something you can fix. And so we print a new line because um, just for the hell, <laughs> that doesn't do anything really. And what do we do next? We take the modulus of that value. Just in case they enter like 200 or something, we essentially wrap the value around. And if you don't understand the modulus operation, check out my Golang course. Uh, to the end of this video um, in that course i explain it or definitely check out wikipedia or whatever just search online for modulus operation or modulus operator and by doing the modulus of 101 i force the value between 0 and 100. now that we know that our percent has the value between 0 and 100 we can say that number divide by 100 and so this is a floating point division and because this was an unsigned int or int we, have to, we cast it to float 32. Why float 32? We don't need the high precision of float 64. So that's why. And so if this is 100, 100 divided by 100 is just 1, 1.0. 1 so 1.0 1 times the period, remember what the period is. The period is just 1,000. So duration then is 1,000. And so that means keep the LED on for the full cycle. If it's zero, if percent is zero, then 0 divided by 100 is 0, and then 0 times 1,000 is 0, percent is 0. And that means when we come here, we'll see that our duration is 0, and we won't do anything, which means we will not turn it on, which is exactly what we want. We'll turn it off and leave it off for the entire period. And so you can imagine, that's the boundary condition, right? The two end values. We can see that we can calculate a percentage of our period, whatever the user type in. Where do we call this command? Well, in our work function, we want to make sure everything is set up. We don't want the user to start, potentially start entering values before everything is initialized. And what this robot guarantees us is that it would properly initialize our board and our devices before it call the work function. So we know that work function is the right place to launch our Go routine, which is going to be running to get user input. So let's run this and see. Again, this is exercise three. So we should go to that directory. So let's rerun it. And so we do go run. We should start see this is blinking just as before. So yep, on and off. We can change how often our LED, remember we're controlling the second LED. So let's turn it off by entering zero. And so our duty cycle is zero. And so notice our second LED is not coming on at all. Let's turn it on and leave it on by entering 100. And so there you go we have it con full control of it being on 100 percent duty cycle i'll just show you that how my code works uh and why the modulus operation is we can do that and even though it says that when we enter 200 it says the um is 990 is basically because the value wrap wrong like i tell you um so just look at the modulus operation and you get an idea of what's really happening here um and so we do the modulus of 101. And so 50% do the cycle is where we were before. And notice it's going to be blinking like that. 25% do the cycle. We should see it blink, come on for a little bit and off for much longer. 75% do the cycle. It should be on for a little bit and then off for a little bit. Okay. For most of the time, right? So um, we can really control, um, you know, our duty cycle here. And so it's off for 20% of the time. 
So that's why you're barely seeing it blink. If it's on for 20% of the time, you're gonna barely see it on, okay? And that's off most of the time. So hopefully this convinces you that at least in terms of one period or one second, we can control how much of that one second we can be on or off. All right, let's move on. So let's look at this other example. I haven't changed much. We've gone from using two LED drivers to now using a LED driver for LED zero and a direct pin driver for LED one. So what's the difference between the two? So now remember when we look at LED zero and we look, we can see that we have things like brightness control, of course, on off, and you can toggle that LED. When we use in the direct pin driver, we have a different set of methods. Notice we don't have a brightness. We do not have a toggle, but we have things like pulse width modulation right, servo right, and we now have these digital write and digital read, right? Digital write and digital read because we're controlling those pin directly. It's the same pin, but it's just how you want to control it. That is, these drivers are giving you that added benefit of taking care of some of that details for you. So if you're going to control that pin directly, well, you might want to be able to use it pulse mod modulation over it. Whereas when you use in as LED, you might want to be able to control brightness. Now the brightness behind the scene is going to do pulse width modulation, but it doesn't expose it for LED as pulse width modulation because that's a detail you don't really need to care about. You just care about the brightness. Okay. So what I want to see is, is there a difference? Um, can we control the brightness of an LED using the LED driver or the direct pin driver if we can pulse it fast enough? Now, remember what I said for what we want to do with pulse width modulation, we want to do about a thousand pulses per second. And so if we go to our exercise four directory and let's clear the screen there and we try to run our example. So we have it connected and we try to run our example, we'll see that how we cannot control it. I'll turn on the light here and I'll show you a device that I have. I have this from a buddy of mine uh, years ago. It's from a company called Celia, S-A-L-E-A-E.com. It's called Logic. And what it is it? It's a USB device with these pins and you can connect it. So for example, I have the ground pin here connected to ground on my Arduino, on my ESP8260. And I'll take these two channels and the two channel is ch channel zero is black channel one is a minus eight po channels. So from zero to seven, I'll take channel zero connected to this um, D to our GPIO five and then channel one out connected to our GPIO four. Okay. And so now let's start this back up. And so let's wait for that to start up. And we don't care about the LED because the LEDs are not powered right now. So that doesn't matter. And so what we want to see is this application that I have here. And you can click here and this is my device. You can have multiple devices if you have them connected to your computer. The lowest um, sample rate is 25 kilohertz in this for this device. Can go lower than that. Of course, it can go much higher to 24 megahertz. So that's pretty impressive. But I'm going to sample for 20 seconds. I don't think we need to go much longer than that. Um, you could do milliseconds or whatever. And then I'll click start. Okay. And now, right now, my program is not running. So let's run it. And remember, this is ex exercise four in which we're doing microseconds. We're supposed to be doing it really fast. And so I can let this run for the 20 seconds. It's going to stop automatically. Um, but if we stop it now, it just shows what it's collected so far. And as you can see, at first, I wasn't collecting any samples for the first six seconds. And then as you can see, um, this shows you that a lot of activity was happening. So that's why we need to zoom in. And you can use your mouse to sort of zoom in to see what's going on. And so I can see that oh, the signal width is just varying all over the place. And yet in the code, we didn't have any such thing. In the code, we simply said, depend on the duration, turn this on, sleep a little bit, and then off. And since our, we're doing this every um, thousand mi microseconds, which is one millisecond essentially, there's another way of putting this is to say, do this every one millisecond. If we had done every one millisecond, we'll have the exact same thing. Thousand times per second, I want you to turn things on if it's supposed to be on, 
and how long should it be on for? Well, that's off of, so in our case, this is 500 microseconds or it should be half a millisecond because a thousand microsecond is one millisecond, so half. How do I know this is half? Because here, this still wouldn't work. So if we stop this, rerun our code, let's see. And we do another sample. We sample for a little bit, our code is run. Well, it hasn't started running yet. Looking at it back there, I could see it hasn't started running yet. Um, but it's connecting. Okay, it's running now. So we should, after about 10 seconds, we should have some data. So let's just stop this. And um, there we go. We can see again the varying um, values that tells us that, you know, it's not running, working correctly. Okay. You can see just from high level that it's very tremendously. So there's a variation all over the place. And there you can see it. Okay. Um, it sort of looked like it's working, um, but it's not working exact stop this and let's connect back our plug this out and connect back our leds so this is the first led and this is our second led and then we reconnect it i told you this is going to be a long video because i'm walking going through this painstakingly slow and all of this disconnecting and reconnecting takes a long time and so if we rerun our code and again, you can see it's not quite dimming it um, and it's blinking, blinking. So this is not working. So what is happening here? What is happening is you remember we're using formatter. And so this code, you know, this on off is running on my laptop and it has to send that instruction over the network to the board to say, turn on the LED, turn it off. But then I'm expecting this to do it a thousand times per second. So if you look at my network, you should see a lot of activity on the network. So the thing I want to call out here is that while formatted protocol is great and I love Go for what it's doing, do not try to do anything that's near real time with this stuff. Because even if you were doing it over USB or, you know, directly connected to your computer, remember that your computer have other programs to run also. So that's the key why it really can keep up is because there's just so much activity and the time, the latency it takes to say, hey, turn it on, turn it off. And still it's trying to do its best. And it was sort of kind of close. Um, and we can see that from, from here, it's sort of kind of close. If we put this here, you can see 0.5 milliseconds. So like half a millisecond, and you can certainly see it above, above there, it says one kilohertz. So it was really trying. Um, it's just that it really couldn't hold it. All right. So with that in mind, the question is, is there a better way? Does this mean that oh, we're shot? We, we can't do this. So let's go look at example five. And we're still sticking with that circuit. Remember the same thing from before. If you need to switch um, to Arduino, what to do. So now the only change I've made is I've, I'm doing this every one second. So every one second, I'm going to change. I'm going to make a change. Or I'll, I'll, I'll make a change if the LED brightness change, right? I mean, I'll write a new LED value. And so, but notice every one second, I say the brightness level should be whatever level is. And the LED pulse width modulator uh, should write whatever the level is, because I'm still using that LED function and the direct pin. Remember with LED, I have the control for brightness. With direct pin, I have digital write, digital read, but also pulse width modulation write. So what is different about this? Um, are we gonna be able to dim our board? And this code hasn't changed other than to say, that now we're using level as opposed to duration on. Why level? Because when we look at the parameter for brightness and positive modulation, right? It's a byte value. Byte value goes from zero to 255. So now when we read from a user the percentage for what they want, we want to convert that to a fraction or a percentage of 255. And that's all that's happening. So notice I've changed this to no cast it to the whole result to a byte. And we took away period and duration because we don't really care. And now we care about this level. So hopefully that's straightforward. So let's try example five. So we go to example five and we're going to run. And so I've connected back my LED. Um, I'm not using my cilia right now. And um, let's see what's going to happen when they start running. And so Right now, we don't see anything. So did I make a mistake? But let's see, let's type zero, it's off, let's do 100. Okay, there it is, it's on. 
uh, let's do 50. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, the reason why it was off because I my byte level, I just declared a variable byte, so the by default it was zero. So here is zero is off, 100% is on, and notice both of my thing come on, and then 50. Look at that, it's half as dim. I'm dimming both of them, and notice how I'm controlling them. I'm using for LED, I'm using brightness. For for direct pin, I'm using pulse with modulation right. The result is the same. We have LEDs connected to those two pins, and I could control it. So 25%, it should go down a little bit. 10%, it should go down even a little bit more. I mean, if I go to 5%, you can probably barely see it, all right? 1%, it should be almost half, but you can't really tell. Um, 2%, it's so faint. I don't know if you even noticed how that faintly came up a little bit just now. Um, again, 5%, uh, you barely can see it. Zero, yep, you can barely see it, right? 90%. Um, there we go. 90% is so close to 100, we might be able to tell any difference, right? But 80% maybe we can tell, right? So 80, 100, yeah, I can't even tell. But 70%, so it's so faint, but it's actually absolutely doing it, right? Um, there's 50, um, 60 come up a little bit <laughs> 70 but anyway i'm wasting time but hopefully i've convinced you now that this work and if we put back our logic device um or logic analyzer on this you'll see that all is actually keeping up and what is happening is that the go code is actually using um built in the modules pulse modulation support now you can go look at the source code or you can go read about it so if you go to golang framework and then you click on blog and you do a search for PWM, um, Pulse with Modulation. Uh, you can see that oh, there was a release of GoBot 1.5 and where they implemented Pulse with Modulation. And you can read all about, about that and see how to, um, to use it. Um, so I look at the source code and it's actually using the built-in like library if it's available. If it's not there, of course, on the pins that we're using, notice we're using this on pin five and four, but for our um, ESP8266 board, pulse width modulation, built-in pulse width modulation is not supported on that pin, but yet we're still able to control a LED tied to that pin. On this pin, it's built in. So what I think the GoBot library is doing is if the pin has built-in su support from the board, it knows that and it configured the internal circuitry to do that. And then in on pins that don't, well, it simulates it, but it's so good at doing it, that we don't have the problem that we saw before when it was just blinking all weird and we couldn't do it. So that's certainly the way to go. So that's why I mentioned in the objective, the hard way of doing it is us trying to write it. The easy way of doing it is exactly like this. Okay, so let's move on. So what then is our example six? In example six, all I did was just take this up to another level. I instead try to control five LEDs. Now, in this example, we're going to switch and use Arduino, right? And so there's the, my Arduino port. Now, remember what I said, you have to change that and you change from new TCP adapter to just new adapter. And of course you have to change a pin. And so I use those pin. And what am I going to do in my work function? Just random stuff. Um, one of the pin, I'm actually doing it the way we were doing it before, which is every second. So every second, that's another way of saying it. Every second, I want to turn this on, sleep for half a second, you know, 500 millisecond, turn it off. That's all I'm doing, toggling that first LED. The next, and all of these are direct pin drive. Doesn't really matter though. The second LED, I'm gonna do it again. Same thing, every second, you know, depending on a thousand millisecond, one second, I've been saying that over and over, but now I'm going to do a random number between zero and a thousand milliseconds, turn that into a time that duration multiplied by millisecond. And so we should see just random stuff happening on this pin in terms of what, how long it's on and off for. But notice I'm just doing on and off thing every second. Some of the other pins, every two seconds, again, I'm writing every two seconds, I'm writing a random value to pulse right so there's a dimness so the dimness occurs every two seconds but it's a random value between 0 and 255 um actually this would be 256 because of how this guy works so in this pin led3 
I'm varying uh, the brightness randomly every 50 milliseconds. So that's going to occur way too fast for you to even notice anything. So maybe we should do every, uh, uh, I don't know, like this is, this is exactly the same as two. So maybe every second instead. All right. Um, for LED four, what I'm doing is every six milliseconds, I update the brightness and notice that every six milliseconds, I increment or decrement that brightness by one. Now, the reason for all this accounting and this logic is just so that I can determine when I'm increasing it from zero to the maximum value, and then I'm bringing it back from the maximum value down to zero. So I have this sort of gradual fading on and gradual fading off that's going to happen on the last, um, the last LED. And if you want to know what the Arduino connection is like, it's simply this that I'm going to be connecting. All right, I'll end it here and I will not ru show you me running the Arduino example because it's just the same as running all the other example we did before this. The only thing I want to point out is that on my board, my Arduino board, that I did not get the LED connected to pin four to toggle. I don't know why that is. It could be that my board is bad. Um, I have another Arduino board that is not working at all. So maybe it's possible that so this one just have a fault. Also, I uh, have these board a long time. If you use an Arduino Uno and with the same code, you can toggle your pin on pin four, please let me know. The reason I want to know is that if for some reason that our, um, our pin four on the Arduino have to be configured differently, that would be sort of weird because the code seemed consistent for pin two, three, five, and six. I don't know why pin four would be a different number. Um, but I'd like to know. Uh, in the meantime, it'll take me a little bit to get another Ar Arduino board, so I couldn't hold back the video t t just to do that. The next example, example seven, is just like the one for Arduino, example six. The only difference is that it's for five LEDs on the ESP8266. So again, the pin numbers are in there. Um, try it out. Let me know where you have problems or if you have additional questions. In the next part for this, I'm going to look at trying to get pulse modulation working on maybe a uh, Raspberry Pi, but certainly we're going to try and get it to control a motor. I want to show you that. That's not only just blinking LED that we can actually do something like control a motor. Okay, take care. Thanks for your time. This video is already too long. So have a great day.